mutation management as crisis mitigation and prevention. Second, crisis types in a modern global environment. Third, organizational factors affecting crisis response. And fourth, stakeholder factors affecting crisis response. And now we focus on the fifth critical factor, response factors to consider. Now we've been talking about the communicative response, how to think about issues in crisis communication, and consider different ways that organizations could respond. We've also certainly critiqued responses. However, now's the time that we'll focus much more closely on putting it all together. Before we get into the particulars of crisis response strategies and planning, I want to put this in what should be a familiar context, that of a campaign. As I've mentioned before, most of what we do in crisis communication follows the same form and function of any other strategic communication campaign. It's just that the crisis response and the crisis plan live at the heart of it. While the previous four factors are vital components in understanding crisis communication, the value that communication scholars add to the field's understanding of crisis is the communication element. Crisis response tactics or strategies have been studied for more than 20 years with several taxonomies emerging including Benoit's summary of image repair tactics, Coombe's discussion of tactics used in situational crisis communication theory, or Mohamed Gardner and Paolo's 1999 taxonomy of organizational impression management tactics, along with a host of individual studies identifying different individual tactics. The result of all this work was the identification of more than 40 distinctive response tactics that could be used in a nearly infinite number of combinations in order to respond to crises. However, I've worked to group all of these tactics into eight broad categories, and so we'll go through these categories to explore the critical themes of the tactic categories and pull out some examples and discussion points about them. The first broad category of crisis response is self-enhancement, or making the organization look good. As a category, this includes traditional marketing communication, something that goes on as expected for brands during crisis, but may have some adaptations because of the particulars of the crisis. This also includes image-related advertising. For example, after the 2014 horsemeat scandal in the UK, where horsemeat from Romania had been relabeled as beef on its stop in the Netherlands by a key supplier, it found its way into most of the UK grocery store supply chains. One of the ways that companies had tried to rebuild confidence in their brands was to add a British label and local sourcing to highlight the change in their providence of the meat. So that by the end of the crisis, people generally knew that the horse meat had been sourced from abroad and relabeled. So as a crisis response tactic, highlighting the source of the meat was a way to promote store brands and indirectly address the substance of the crisis without specifically mentioning it. This is pretty typical of how self-enhancement strategies can be used. But what organizations have to be careful of is the branding themselves as excellent in the midst of a crisis because it can seem incredibly tone deaf. So while promotion is critical, understanding how to promote is vital or the organization can end up with a reputational crisis on top of a material one. Similarly, routine communication techniques may also be used to address crises where the organization focuses on its mission or vision as part of responding to a crisis, or even uses outlets like their annual reports or employee newsletters to directly discuss the crisis. Often these are meant to reassure stakeholders about the situation. These crisis response strategies emphasize communication about the organization, who it is, and what it does. Like the self-enhancement strategies, routine communication is not exclusive to crisis response messages. However, the occurrence of an organizational crisis would also suggest these routine communications would be likely to report on the crisis, its effects, and address stakeholder concerns about the organization's viability both during and after the crisis. However, in shifting the focus from tactics that can be applied to crises to crisis-specific tactics, the third category focuses on tactics that frame the crisis itself. 
If an organization can be viewed as a reliable source of information about the status of the situation, provide persuasive accounts of what's happening, then it's well positioned to have a voice that's heard across multiple platforms from social media to traditional news media coverage. In essence, it can control the agenda about the situation itself. In this strategy, organizations choose to explain the crisis, their role in it, how important it is, and what they're doing about it by using one of the crisis response strategies that frame the crisis. In addition to trying to define the crisis for their stakeholders, organizations may also choose to incorporate crisis response strategies that frame the organization. In this way, they're making claims about the character of the organization as a way to potentially minimize negative effects of the crisis. This next approach is quite different because the antisocial or defensive tactics that center on minimizing blame attribution with a range of tactics from denial to obfuscation to fairly aggressive tactics like intimidation. Now, there's been a lot of research devoted towards these types of crisis response strategies, and a number of strategies have consequently been identified that typify an organization's communicative effort to basically cover themselves or refuse to admit culpability for the crisis. Now, 10 or 15 years ago, these types of response tactics were commonplace. Research suggests, though, that today people are much less persuaded by negative messaging. So these approaches to minimize blame have, have fallen out of vogue to some extent. But the question about how an organization can and should defend itself is something that's still being debated. On the opposite side of the coin to the antisocial or defensive strategies are the accommodative crisis response strategies in which the organization communicates an emphasis on compliance, helpfulness, contrition, openness, and empathy. So an organization that might be admitting to fault and or emphasizing coping and, and sympathy typify the accommodative strategies. These strategies are naturally very pro-social and very much emphasize a socially responsible or ethical re crisis response strategy. In some circumstances, organizations may also choose to demonstrate their excellence in crisis response by promoting dialogue with stakeholders, discussing the organization's leadership in the time of a crisis, or emphasizing its social responsibility. The hallmark of these crisis response strategies is a communicated emphasis on moving forward beyond the crisis. These could certainly be communicative efforts that occurred during a crisis, but also after as well. Finally, organizations may also choose to emphasize either their positive or negative relationships with other organizations. And in this way, they can either try to borrow credibility from positively viewed partners or distance themselves from other organizations with a negative reputation. It might even be that they directly attack organizations as a way of shifting attention away from themselves. But anything around these is emphasizing the interorganizational relationships. Certainly, crisis response involves critical decision making that works to balance the nature of the crisis, the organization, and stakeholders to create strategic messages that help an organization manage its crisis issues. Effective crisis response involves the identification of critical objectives for the crisis response, targeted stakeholders, identification of key messages, as well as the platforms to communicate those messages on. In many cases, organizations actually select multiple different tactics and use them in various combinations as they develop their responses, and they use them differently across different platforms of communication. For example, in my research into the BP response to the 2010 spill in the Gulf of Mexico, my colleagues and I found that across their press releases, Twitter, and Facebook posts from April to October 2010, that while the core elements of BP's response strategy were fully presented in its press releases, but that its Twitter and its Facebook posts each applied the strategy differently, emphasizing different elements and different tactics.
Yet in the case of BP, there have also been a host of analyses of its crisis response strategy across various platforms, suggesting that crisis response itself can be incredibly dynamic and complex and use a lot of different kinds of tactics depending on the particular platform and the communicators from the same organization. My doctoral research was an effort to try and identify a definitive set of strategies that would emerge from these tactics, along with the organizational and situational factors predicting when different strategies or combinations of the tactics might emerge. So in that research, I analyzed 133 different crises and came up with a good list of strategies. Thing is, though, that what I and other crisis researchers have learned since is that there is virtually an infinite combination of tactics that organizations can use in response to crises. In other words, we're just unlikely to find an all-inclusive topology that would emerge from these tactics and tactic categories. But what the research did suggest very clearly was that organizational and situational factors influence crises substantially. This research largely supports Tim Coombe's work with the situational crisis communication theory. So for example, research generally finds that crisis prone organizations tend to focus on more future oriented strategies. And of course, there are different appropriate responses within that particular cultural and crisis type context, but that's about as precise as we can often be. Remember that research in the adaptation of crisis response strategies to different stakeholder groups is still in its infancy. Because our field is still relatively young, the field's first step was to understand how organizations respond, and now we're moving into a phase where we're beginning to focus on whether those responses actually work and for whom they work. So to begin to get a picture of not only how these tactics can be combined into response strategies and see some of the factors that influence them, let's work through some examples of the types of crisis response strategies that do emerge can be tailored to the crisis, organization, and most certainly the stakeholders. The first example of a crisis strategy is the defensive strategy. This often incorporates some kind of minimization of the problem, explanations of the situation to help clarify the organization's role, denial of responsibility, and in other words, these are seen as image protection messages. Defensive responses may often be necessary, particularly when the organization is accused of something it didn't do or has to defend itself against attacks. However, as I mentioned earlier, research is increasingly demonstrating that these kinds of response strategies are not particularly endearing to stakeholders. So in many cases, they should be seen as risky kinds of response. Yet it hasn't been all that long that defensive strategies, especially denial and strategic ambiguity, were seen as go-to responses. However, today's publics expect more transparency from their organizations. A second example of a crisis response strategy is the accommodative response. This often includes an apology, emphasis on empathy for those who are affected, and certainly demonstrates a commitment towards solving the problem. Naturally, this is the direct opposite of the defensive response. But what's interesting is that the use of apology has mixed findings across the body of crisis communication research. However, the focus on doing what's right by stakeholders, especially those directly affected by the organization, is viewed as essential, and the findings are pretty consistent on that. But let me offer you a caveat. This has to be more than a thoughts and prayers kind of response. In the next podcast focusing directly on the apologetic ethics framework, I'll talk about what it really means to communicate accommodation within the context of an organization that's committed a transgression. The third example of a crisis response strategy that's pretty common are image-oriented responses. These focus on promoting the organization without any negativity found in the defensive responses, but also without apology or accommodation. Certainly, these are often used by organizations trying to move beyond a crisis. In many cases, organizations will use corporate social responsibility initiatives, either past or present, to demonstrate that the organization itself is responsible and it cares about its community. 
However, in a lot of cases, this can be a strategic error on the case of the organization. CSR has long been considered to deliver somewhat inconsistent returns in terms of improving an organization's reputation and its relationship with stakeholders. However, as you'll find in the podcast on putting lipstick on a pig, CSR is less likely to help an organization with a poor reputation. In fact, it can even have the opposite effect, coming across as mere lip service and creating negative feelings. So given that we know that one of the most likely risks associated with crises is a hit to an organization's reputation, it would seem pretty clear that image-oriented responses to the crisis, especially as part of the immediate crisis recovery, are probably not the best approach. The final example of a crisis strategy that I want to talk about are status updates. And these recognize that a critical component to managing communication with stakeholders during a crisis is simply providing information to them about the crisis. This is probably the single most common type of crisis response strategy, and it's really important because it's about the organization getting information to stakeholders who are interested as quickly and responsibly as possible. As we've talked about during previous podcasts, one of the critical features of a crisis is that it creates uncertainty. This means that people have a heightened need for communication, and especially communication from people in positions of power who are related to the crisis. Failure for organizations or even governments to put some of their top leadership in front of critical stakeholders to provide routine updates on the situation can be a strategic mistake, especially when the crisis is big and it affects a lot of people. So one of the critical mistakes that organizational leaders have made time after time after time is simply not being available to their stakeholders as people expect during a crisis. For example, in 2014, when the Malaysian Airlines flight disappeared, most of the people on that flight were Chinese and the company's leaders were not available to answer questions and just didn't conduct enough press briefings to satisfy the families of those on board. This created a serious reputational crisis on top of the disappearance of the flight. And this was fundamentally a communication problem or lack of providing simple status updates, even if there weren't material updates to present being there. Similarly, in 2020, Boris Johnson was not readily available for daily updates on COVID-19 in the UK. Now, for part of that time, he had a pass from the British public because he was hospitalized with COVID-19 himself. However, before that and afterwards, when after his release from the hospital, he was still largely missing from the daily briefings. This seriously eroded public confidence in his government's response, despite having ministers present for the daily briefings. And let me note real quickly that in the UK, health is handled by each of the four nations, England, Scotland, Northern Ireland, and Wales independently, but with as much coordination amongst them to the degree possible, so that in this case, Johnson and his ministers were only representing England, not the whole of the UK. So Johnson's presence or lack thereof stood in stark contrast to Scotland's first minister, Nicola Sturgeon, who delivered nearly every daily briefing from March through July 2020 with a similar pattern of routine updates and then responding to media questions just like the English one. But not only was there certainly a content difference in the briefings between the English and the Scottish response, but there was also a difference in having the primary leader for the nation available. So status updates during crises are necessary, and the best practice is that when the crisis is severe, they should probably be delivered by the top official. More often than not, no matter what that country's leader, country, region, CEO, whoever that might be. But based on the field's understanding of crisis response, at this point, we can provide a list of possible ingredients, that is the tactics, some of the common flavors used in crisis response, and some guidelines for who does and does not work, and what does and does not work. But while there's no definitive set of strategies that organizations should use in different situations, we should begin to understand that if we are mindful of stakeholder needs and interests, then we can begin to assemble response strategies that serve their interests and thus help organizations better manage relationships with stakeholders during the crises.